What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. And if you don't know what uh, Mystery Ranch is, well, obviously you're living under a rock or something like that. And also, if you're not fighting fire with a Mystery Ranch Fireline pack, well, your back probably hates you. Yeah, you might want to fix that and talk to your overhead. Anyways, they make the most comfortable, the most badass, and the best damn fire lighting fire lining <laughs> wildland firefighting pack in the game hands down period end of subject but in addition to that they make a ton of other awesome load bearing essentials like well i'm actually looking at two of them right now you got the urban assault 21 pack and the three-way briefcase both in wildfire black <gasps> Ooh, why do i mention these well a portion of the proceeds from these specific packs are going to go back to the Mystery Ranch Backbone Series Scholarship. Yeah. So if you don't know what the uh, Mystery Ranch Backbone Series is, well, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out the Backbone Series because you have an opportunity to not only educate the public, but have one of these $1,000 Mystery Ranch Backbone Series Scholarships up for grabs. So if you have a compelling story and it is chosen and it's not written in crayon, well, one of these scholarships is up for grabs for you. You can use it for... Well, anything that's going to help further your career along. I know that, you know, EMT classes or S courses, they're not exactly cheap. So you can utilize this opportunity to further your career. For all those uh, out there that have submitted their stories, kudos to you. You're going above and beyond the line of duty to showcase your talents and educate the public. And I appreciate that about you. So once again, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by our premier coffee sponsor, and that's going to be none other than Hot Shot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. Not only just kick-ass coffee for kick-ass causes do they make. Ooh, what else do they make, you might ask? Well, you've probably seen a bunch of their merch and a bunch of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off the right way. So if you want to uh, find out more or get any of this wildland firefighter themed apparel and help represent the wildland firefighter culture or get some of these tools like some arrow presses or some pour over systems or some pretty rad coffee cups, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. And while you're at it, go over there and check out some of the Anchor Point Podcast merch. Ooh, yeah. So they support us by slinging some of our exclusive merch. So if you want to get your hands on one of those Band of Brothers tees or one of those Fire Fiend tees, well, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check out their full line of kick-ass coffee for kick-ass causes, their full line of wildland firefighter-themed apparel, and all of the tools to get your morning started off right. Go check them out. And last but not least, the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be brought to you by the Smoky Generation, also known as the American Wildfire Experience. And if you don't know what that is, well, it is another storytelling platform telling the story of wildland fire, but globally, which is pretty freaking rad if you ask me. So if you want a little trip down memory lane or hear some stories from your peers in the field, well, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check out all they have to offer. And while you're at it, Check this out. You have an opportunity to win one of these $500 Smoky Generation grants by telling the story of wildland fire. Doesn't matter if you're a blogger, a writer, a photographer, a cinematographer, anybody who's telling the story of wildland fire, well, now's your opportunity to take advantage of this uh, $500 Smoky Generation grants. So once again, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check it out. Bethany, you have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. Podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency.
What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Hope everybody's doing well, and I hope everybody's taking care of themselves and getting their reps in for the upcoming season. It is right around the corner, and apparently it started in some areas. I just saw a, like, a 100-acre, 1,000-acre fire. I don't know, big fire down in SoCal, but it's kind of in a breed of its own. But anyways, today on the show, we're going to talk about taking care of ourselves, right? And we're going to talk about uh, how these mental health issues keep popping up, and we tend to take things to the extreme and also tend to self-medicate yeah we're gonna be talking about hitting the bottle a little bit too hard and the road to recovery so what better person than an expert in the subject and somebody that has lived that life that could tell the story of how they turned themselves around and how they got better yeah alcoholics uh alcoholism uh it, it sucks man it's a it's a tragic road to go down but the truth is is you can make it better so if you're uh, having some issues by hitting the bottle or uh, have some other people call you out, well, you might want to do some self-reflection like this gentleman did and uh, take the road to recovery. Maybe talk to somebody, get some help. It's okay. These things happen. But with that being said, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Mr. Jesse Morlock. Welcome to the Anchor Point. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I've got my good ass buddy, Jesse. Jesse, what's going on, man? You got a hell of a story to tell us. I, I, I kind of like where this is going to because a lot of people need to hear your message, but a lot of people are uh, like talking about it. I like this, man. I'm just chilling up on a day off in Montana. Nice. Uh, Bitterroot Valley. Nice and sunny day. Just finished a cold snap. So stoked to be enjoying a little bit of sun in my house. Right on, Not man. Outside. Not outside. <laughs> yeah. I bet it's cold as all hell up there. Man, I, Montana in the winter. I mean, where I'm at is kind of the nice part of Montana too. Like it's the, the banana belt of Montana. Oh. So it's only, you know, in the cold snap, like negative 14 at night, you know? Yeah. I'll, I'll hard just go over that. the hill to wisdom and it's negative 28 during the day. Nope. That's a big bag yeah. of nope for me, dog. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm all right with that. We just got heaters in my barn. So that's nice. Last winter was a little rough. <laughs> but Dude, I can imagine. way better this year. Negative 28. Jesus, man. That's, that's, yeah, that's bitter. Bitter cold. Yeah. No. It's a big bag of nuts. So Jesse, tell us about yourself, man. Uh, so tell us about your fire <laughs> career, what you did, where you've been, like what you do, what's going on, man. Tell uh, us about you. So I started, I'm from Southern California, Victorville. Um, I started my fire career on an AD crew out of the San Bernardino National Forest, San Bernardino National Forest up um, this is the Mojave Green crew. And I did that for a year and then I uh, transitioned from the, uh, you know, like AD on call hand crew went straight into Hell Attack working for Heaps Peak Hell Attack and was the uh, least experienced guy by six years on that crew. And, you know, to, in family day, one of the guys named Paul Logan, you know, my dad comes up and my dad's been in the fire biz for a while. You know, this guy, Paul's like, yeah, we're going to make your son bleed green. It was pretty good experiences on that crew. And from there, I moved up to the last end and did some time on a type three engine out of mineral. Um, you know, uh, from there I worked on a helicopter 503 in the uh, Klamath national forest out of happy camp for a couple of years. Oh boy. Happy camp. Everybody's favorite place. Yeah. You know, it's really pretty when you're on your days off sitting by the river. <laughs> That's what I hear. But otherwise it's yeah. sleeping <laughs> shitty. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hot. And so and then after that, I uh, moved up to region one and finished this past season, my third season on Bitterroot uh, Hot Shots. And yeah, it's been cool. Kind of a 
going to four different forests and seeing some different ways fighting fire in different regions and got to meet a bunch of cool folks along that way. So yeah, that's a little bit of my fire career. Nice man. So did heaps peak make you uh bleed green and ride for the brand or did they uh, make you move on or what's going on there? Are you still bleed riding for the brand or what? Um, honestly, heaps peak. I don't think uh, if we're being brutally honest, I don't think I was like quite ready enough coming from an AD crew to be thrust into like the professionalism of dudes who had already been hot shots. And it was a huge realization of uh, like what to expect, you know, it's like, I didn't really have the break in period of going to an engine or a type two crew first. And so it was honestly kind of a shock and I was young and turned 21 that year, 2021. So I was definitely, you know, drinking a lot more than I should have been. And if there anything I learned from that season on heaps peak, you know, it's those guys really had my back for sure. And dealt with a lot of me being an idiot in 21. So it's, it affected my fire career just with, um, trying to make better choices, I guess, you know, shout out to those guys for being super rad. That's cool, man. And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of wild that you say that you started off on an AD crew because I actually started off 80 and, and I, uh, I did one of those same decisions where I kind of made the leap to a crew that I was definitely not prepared for. And, uh, yeah, I got my ass handed to me and, uh, yeah, it was definitely a good learning experience, man. And like, I think there's uh, a point there to where like stepping from a green hotshot or a green firefighter into a hotshot crew or a hell attack crew, some of those high speed, low drag organizations, man, you might want to pump the brakes and reconsider getting some, uh, some uh, miles under your feet before you make that decision. Yeah. I mean, uh, probably all, you know, depends on who you are as a person, I would guess, you know, it's for me and that's all I can talk about is this wasn't quite ready, but you know, like jump, I've seen people, there's this gal, one of my good homies, Ivy, um, she came from a job corps up here in Montana, right? Never done season at all in fire and, uh, was very eager to talk to all of her bosses there and then got put on to Bitterroot, just thrown on, you know, here you go. We we're already done with criticals and we were going. So she hopped on and she kicked ass, man. So, I mean, you have your people who I think, have it at that point. And then you have maybe people like me that were just a little young and dumb. Oh yeah. yeah. I was definitely one of those people, man, that and I came <laughs> not from fire or anything like really, truly physical, uh, as physical in nature as firefighting. And I decided, yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to be a hot shot. And yeah. Fucking good luck, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Lessons learned. But yeah, man. Uh, so you made your way up from Southern California, all the way to Northern mm -hmm. California. And then you took a hard right over into Montana. Mm -hmm. And then that's where your story kind of, I guess the, the new you kind of takes off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I've, uh, decided to, I guess, take a tactical pause from the forest service and, uh, I've had an opportunity to start working with horses and it uh, feels right. So we're just going to keep going with that. You know, it's a, uh, if you would have asked me two years ago that I would have been doing this full time with the, like, you know, managing a show horse barn for a private owner, probably would have said you're crazy, but we're here and we're doing it now. And it's really nice. And I've actually, you know, never felt as good. It's a really nice break mentally for me from, uh, the forest service, just not the forest service in general, the agency, but just, you know, fire, you know, you sort of been season. Yeah. 10. So it's uh time to, for me to take a break because I got to a point where things started to get a little more hard than fun. And that's not how I want to remember that job because it's the best job I've ever had. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Best job that I've ever had as well, man. But it's not without its problems, man. And it leads down, 
it can has it does have the potential to lead down some dark paths. I mean, if you look at the entire industry as a whole, we're fraught with problems, man. And uh, yeah, in the previous episode to this, it was we were talking with Monica, and uh, yeah, we're we're kind of known for being a surly bunch, right? And that's oh, yeah. the drinking, the fighting, the divorces, all this crap that kind of plagues our community. And I think that it's just now coming to light that, Hey, we need to like nip this stuff in the bud, right. And really take care of ourselves. It's not necessarily a sign of weakness, but it's definitely a generational change that I've been noticing. And you and I have come up in very similar times, right? I did 11 I years. I feel like it's 10. The, the, the bridge between the old and new. Yeah. You know, a hundred percent the transition. Yeah. Well, you got to see some of that old school, which I'm pretty sure you experience on heaps. And then you got to see some of that new school and then yeah, you're taking I that. Grew up my, my father is a, on a type one team. He, you know, he's been in the fire service for a long time. So I, I grew up with my dad telling me at like six years old, Oh son, you know, when you grow up, you could be a hot shot. And it's like first I, I, you know, first time at an ICP was at like nine years old. First helicopter ride at like five. And I was just kind of groomed for that. So a lot of that change has been real weird to see, especially it's like kind of been instilled. Oh yeah. Especially when that, there's some of those old school values that would probably never leave uh, that in between generation like you and I. Yeah but then cut out the toxic shit. That's just super negative towards us all. Yeah. It's trimming the fat, right? Yeah. I think it's a good thing, but a while ago, man, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. It was like dark corners of the reality of our job is it's stressful. And, uh, like I said, it's, it's fraught with problems, man. And it tends to lead to a lot of self medication and other things. And that's actually oh, yeah. the topic of what our show is going to be about today. And your particular story, you reached out to me, what, about a year ago? Almost a year ago, I want to say. Looking for some yeah, some help. Yeah. Just about. I still have the picture on my phone of, uh, yeah, when I posted on there, like, can drink. Yeah, real rough place. And I reached out to you because you make yourself very available to us. And, I try. Yeah. I try. Yeah, well, it worked. <laughs> so, what happened, man? I mean, that what was like the whole lead up to that? Was it just like, uh, um, like the cumulative stress, or what? What? Tell us the story, man. It might be a little bit of a long answer, but that's fine. So, a little background on me. Um, growing up in like Victorville and whatnot, you know. Did, pre-fire season stuff like I would huge into like rock climbing and all this and I'd always travel around like dirt bag climber like climbing but I'm used to climb like 300 days a year like I've lived in a cave in Joshua Tree National Park for like six months without a car you know and dumb shit like that just having fun and um in that I just you know getting a lot of rushes from climbing as you're getting adrenaline kicks and kind of living a full volume life, you know, and then that transfers to fire really well. And, um, you know, you're constantly in this full volume, super dynamic environment on the fire ground. And you're constantly having all of the stimuli coming towards your way. And then when you're off, of it right your fire season's done that what what are you filling it with you know me i chose like climbing and partying my ass off and so i would just go around off season to off season you know go spend a winter in j tree go to moab go to you know wherever the wind blew me and just having a righteous good time being a dirty little desert rat you know living in a tent in moab at a hostel like crashing next to you know, granite domes on the Trinity river, just like having a living in squalor and happy about it. But, um, when you, uh, 
get to that point where you do that repeatedly and repeatedly you are never in one spot long enough for anybody to notice your um, problems that you have. And, uh, well, I had, uh, been running essentially from any like stressors or anything, relationship problems. I had a slew of breakups. I used to call it like a fire season curse, you know, which I mean, now reflection being sober is a lot more clear, you know, the past 10 years of stupid shit and relationships that have gone on to, you know, definitely didn't need to be in, you know, in a relationship with somebody who's either living full volume, like climbing super hard, doing something that's risky, impulsive, dangerous, or firefighting. And no in between isn't very fun for somebody. It's almost boring. So, um, yeah. So all of that stuff compounds on each other. Right. And when I moved to Montana, I moved up here. Um, I was in a relationship, kind of followed my partner up here uh, who's in fire as well. And, you know, we went our separate ways, save the story. But uh, so now here I'm bitter and I'm not leaving. Right. I'm going to, okay. Montana is where I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to be on bitter. And so finally, you know, my problems start to, to catch up because I'm not running from them or at least, you know, they weren't catching up. They were just more noticeable to everybody around me. And, uh, you know, that same season, it was like my, I would get off from, you know, roles and you'd be super tired and whatnot. Right. And you'd have the crew go get a beer. Right. After at the sawmill saloon, it's just down the street from our base. Yeah. You know? We're at end of the roll beer. We're all going our separate ways, except I stay there, you know, and my beer, instead of their, you know, they're getting a pint glass. I'm getting a 32 ounce pitcher. That's my beer. And I just drink it out of the pitcher class. And so you start doing stuff like that. Your friends notice. And one of my really good friends, and I don't think she knows how much, uh, she, it, this means to me that she did it, but, uh, she's on the bitter route with me and she, we went on a drive to this place called the heap in Idaho to go climbing. And she told me, Hey, I'm really worried about you. And I'm really worried about your drinking. And she was actually the first person that told me that she thought I'd been, never had been in a place long enough for my problems to catch up with me. So she was the and first man, one that was like, made you aware of it. Yeah. I mean, other people have made me aware of like my alcohol issues that weren't on my crew, like bitter. And, you know, I'm the type of person that has the attitude of like, yeah, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it at an extreme level. It's either nothing or extreme. So it's like, oh, I'm going to be a high functioning alcoholic, not just a sloppy drunk. And it was hard to notice for a lot of people, you know, but Hannah saw it and she spoke her, her mind on it. So, you know, I got to that point where my crew members were noticing it. Um, my body, I was losing weight really bad. I uh, couldn't keep meals down. I put it this way. I was doing hot shot shifts, maybe eating a thousand calories. That's it per day. Yeah. Damn. That ain't Chew nothing. And man. coffee and pure just stuff. So fast. used to puke every morning. Um, and I thought that was just from nausea. I bet you it was from alcohol withdrawals. Um, you know, my, I've been a hard worker, but I'm not to say that I didn't have my dumb shit and baggage. And I feel a lot more comfortable saying this now that I'm taking you know, probably a long tactical pause from fire and hopefully it'll help somebody because you know, it's a little bit vulnerable to, to say these things, but it takes a lot of courage to say what you have to say. I don't, man. I don't know if it's courage so as much as just probably it's the heart. It's like Hannah taking the hard right to fucking say something to me, you know, so you're trying to pass that on, but 
Yeah, that's just what leading up to what and then me reaching out to you is like all these things. My health is starting to go, can keep food down. Dude, I felt like I was dying. Now you're talking about losing sleep because you're not eating your you just your muscles are atrophied. You know, I had prior injuries that I've had that never healed right. You know, one my right quad and whole thigh is like wicked smaller than my left one which causes a bunch of problems when you're humping packs all day, you know, over a long period of time and imbalance will really mess you up. But so I kept my solution to all this uncomfortability was to drink more. Oh shit. And, uh, that's because I'm an alcoholic. That's an addict's brain, you know? It's a, well, this sucks. So I need this thing that makes me feel better right now, you know? Yeah. It's self-medication. Yeah. So, and the funny part is, you know, like I got a really cheap apartment. Um, for two years, I lived above a bar. <laughs> this is Sawmill Saloon. I live right upstairs from it. So, I mean, convenience was really easy. You know, talk about racking up $500 bar tabs every other day. You know, and, and uh, then uh, close to when I reached out to you, I started to have really bad anxiety and horrible depression. And now what I realized was just absolutely like feeling like I was trapped with like no way out. And that's when like you get real dark thoughts. And then you, it's like, this self perpetuating cycle, right? That you're trying to escape these feelings and you go to the one thing that is causing all of your issues because that's where, you know, it's like, it's a, like an owner kicking a dog and the dog just keeps coming back. It's like you a know, it's, toxic cycle, man. It is. And that's what, you know, I think a lot of people who aren't, people who have the same mental struggles that I do, you know, it's, we're wired differently. You know, I'm not saying that that removes any consequences of action by any means, you know, um, cause where the next part of the story goes, you know, it's like, I reached out to you when I'm literally like getting out of bed with a cold sweat and collapsing on the ground. Like I don't have strength to like hold myself up anymore. And like, I literally just dying. Like I was talking to physicians. I went and got medical tests done on me afterwards. I had damage and stuff, you know, like if I would have kept going, the doctor's like, Oh yeah, solid three years, man. And you would have been in the ground. Oh yeah, for sure. Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, but like I was drinking like 15 to 20 pints of beer a day and like at least 10 to 15 ounces of hard alcohol, if not double that, you know, per day and going to work and coming home from work and getting drunk and going home or going to work. You're repeating that cycle day in and day out like an empty shell. God damn. And, uh, that's a lot. Yeah, I only weigh 140 pounds. You know, I'm that's a tolerance thing. That's not something that you just acquire or do, it's not genetics to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's not like you're Andre the Giant. No, talking with, you know, like <laughs> with, you know, my therapist, it's like, oh, yeah, you're, I was a professional, man, like a, high, a professional, high functioning alcoholic, you know, and, uh, that's kind of uh, the part where I knew that I first started knowing that I needed help because it was, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it alone for sure. Like I, you want to, and I think it's like part of the people in fire's brains, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm going to do this. Like I, I can hot shot my way through this. Oh yeah. That shit, that mentality kind of gets ingrained with you. Like from the very, beginning. Oh yeah. Every day, man, every day. It's like literally if I'm sweeping the barn, I'm like, what's the most efficient way to do these five things just on the way to get the broom. 
you yeah. know, like <laughs> it's so I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm going to just charge this sobriety thing. I know you fail. And then you feel worse and you start drinking again and then you fail again. And then, you know, and then that's when I reached out to you and you're in the guys at hot shot brewery message me and connect me with Burke from the foundation. And, uh, you know, I mean, this all happened within like two hours of me posting you know, like I, I need to quit drinking. Like I need help type of post on Instagram. And two hours later, I'm talking to a, um, great therapist. I won't mention her name cause I don't know if she wants it on a podcast or not, but she's fantastic. And talked to her on the phone for like two hours right after that. And it just was nice. That was the, the start, like a seed was planted in my head for the big change, you know? And then you fast forward from that and I, you know, when things get better a little bit, sometimes people have get complacent mm-hmm. and go back to the thing that was hurting them, you know? Oh yeah. That's like the number like your- one reason for relapse, man. Yeah, you know, you let your guard down a little bit. And so, yeah, I failed again and failed again and failed again. And in April, April, it was the night of April 5th. Oh, no, the morning of April 6th at 3.21 a.m., I think, something like that. I got arrested driving home from uh, Missoula, you know, it's preseason. We start April 15th. You get a DUI on April 6th. You're, 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 you're freaking out. Yeah. And not only that, you know, it's like this happened to be my second DUI. I got my first one when I was a younger guy, when I first was able to drink. I swear, like within the first three months of me drinking, legal age, I got a DUI. So I call my soup and we have our conversation. Uh, He's a really very understanding guy, you know? And so that conversation, I am still allowed to work with fire season, obviously driving limitations and whatnot. Um, which is horrible shitty. You want to talk about anxiety, like call your suit before the season starts telling them you got arrested, you know, and it's, it's humiliating. And so from that moment, right. I get a lawyer and like do all that stuff. And so I find out, okay, I'm going to have to probably settle for two weeks in jail. And I push it back to the end of fire season. So I've got a whole fire season with two weeks of jail in the back of my head. <laughs> you know, it's really a dumb lesson, <laughs> <R-R>. you know? <laughs> it's just like, oh, well, you got to make money to pay for this, you know? And um, they put me on alcohol monitoring in April 6th was the last day that I had booze. And that DUI, the second one, I'm so happy I didn't hurt or kill anyone or myself, number one. And number two, I think it is the best damn thing that has ever happened to me. Because being forced by the county to be put on like you have accountability to uh, Johnny law, you know, it's not, not like, Oh, I'm going to check the box on my calendar today. I was sober. It's not like sitting through an ag learn. Yeah. You know, you're going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're not, and you're going to go back to jail and I already messed up once. So why make it worse? You know? Um, and, uh, yeah, so I started that and Thus started my first ever fire season without any alcohol. <laughs> what were and the changes like, man? Was it 
like totally different? Um, yeah, I felt a lot more even keeled. My crew noticed a difference. I mean, you spend that much hours with somebody, you know, it's, uh, you, they notice a difference for sure. Uh, less depressed, less anxious. Able to keep on weight. Yeah. And, um, just general health is better, but pushed through that season. Ended up doing my time once we got out and then I started back up at the bar and I had started the previous off season, you know, the kind of side mission type of thing. The side quest. <laughs> yeah. Life quests. Yeah. And, uh, and just started last winter and I was super hungry for work just cause there's nothing to do in Rivoli County, Montana in the winter other than work or drink beer. And, uh, so I was down at the bar and was just like, Hey, I need work. Anybody got work? You know, super old, like, felt like old timey, like, you know, screw Craigslist or whatever. I'm just going to go to the saloon and find me a job. And sure shit got a five day opportunity just to cover a shift there. Never worked with a horse ever before. And, um, that ended up turning into a, uh, salaried full-time position. So like Benny's and everything, huh? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. It's real nice. <laughs> paid vacation, paid holidays. I could either take the holiday off and get regular pay or uh, work it and get double pay. So the hot shot in me is like, let's work all holidays. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's no pretty shit. badass. And uh, it's a small, small company. So it's, They've really been taken care of and the horses, man. That, that's honestly been the biggest change in anything. It's a uh, working with horses. You, you get to see a lot more about yourself. So like in equine therapy, the reason they use horses, they're super popular. Is they're one of the most perceptive animals, you know, in the animal kingdom. So they literally like mirror what you're bringing to them, what energy you're going in. If you're anxious, the horse is going to be anxious. If you're uptight, the horse is going to be uptight. That's how herd animals work. If you're angry, the horse is going to be scared, you know? And so when you work with horses on a daily to day basis, it forces you to be in the present moment with them, you know, and you turns, it forces you to turn, you know, that hot, hot shot on and off switch. It's either off, you're chilling or on. Yeah. You know, it, it forces you to learn how to get rid of that switch and become a dial, you know? So if you need to crank it up to 11, you can. You can, but you start at your softest tool first in working with horses, you know, and that's been the most beneficial thing because uh, towards the end of the last fire season, I was just, to be honest, just tired and over it. And lots of, um, between, you know, like close calls on fires and being away from family for long time you know my family's never left southern california like moved anywhere else so it's always going back to them especially with the pandemic and all of that venturing from nice small town montana down to southern california was never really in the books you know in the play so i miss them and just decided to take an alternative route to things now, I guess. That's the thing, man. It's like the, one of the literally one of the worst events that's probably ever happened to you in, in your life translated into something magical that you're like happy. Now you're chill. You're like fucking Zen master right now (laughs) coming from your past where you're just dialed up to 11 the entire time. And now you know how to turn it on and off or crank it up to maybe four or five. 
Yeah, it's like little things like when's the last time a hot shot's not walked fast somewhere? I still do it to this day. Yeah, trying to break that. You can't do that around horses. Oh, no. That, you know, working with 20 medium sized animals, as in humans, is a hell of a lot different to working with uh, four or five or 10 extra big ass animals. <laughs> Not too different, you know, honestly. Really? You know, yeah, you just you make sure they're fed. You, you know, they can have some, some bedding, you know, just make sure it's not too cold. And then, yeah, you're good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, they're like, horses are like four year olds that never grow up. And they're just constantly trying to get into trouble and mischief. Sounds like hot similar to a hot shot crew. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say sounds, sounds real similar to a hot shot. <laughs> yep. Oh man. So I guess the number one question that I have for you is, it's, I mean, it sounds like you're happier now. I mean, is that true? I mean, are you happy? Yeah. It's no comparison, night and day difference. Um, I feel like I kind of stepped out of a self-created prison cell for the first time. Um, but honestly, when you get stopped drinking and you drink like I did, the first part of quitting drinking, um, can understand why people would relapse is you look at all the things that you've done and the done stuff or the, uh, dangerous situations or impulsivity and just acceptance of, you know, your risk management is skewed when you drink, you know? So, uh, seeing, what I did wrong through a different lens in past relationships, you know, not saying everything was my fault and everything that I did, but sure. Alcohol had a big part in a lot of things that happened. Probably the biggest part really. And, um, you realize that between two DUIs and I don't even know how many gallons of swill of drink while I was drinking, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars within seven years. Holy shit. You know, like I'm probably well over 200 grand. And, uh, I have a lot of friends who work fire service, you know, seasonal forest service gig as a forestry tech and they got houses. They got, you know, investments that are holding up or side project businesses and well i have a pickup truck and 11 months sobriety <laughs> you know it's because i wasted all of my stuff away so you just reach this point you're like well what the fuck do i have stories well i don't even remember half of those so <laughs> something's got to change you know so yeah getting rid of that you feel um, grief because you're grieving for all of the loss that you've had. I mean, like my grandparents are getting way older now, you know, it's what happens, you know, mental health declines in an older age. And in my head, you know, I've wasted the past 10 years, you know, um, you get regrets like that, you know, because it's either, oh, I'm doing forest service stuff or I'm drinking. There was no time for family. And my family stuck by me, which I'm really lucky. I'm sure it's, no, well, I'm not sure. I'm like, I know 100% it was super hard for them. And uh, just years and years of that repeated behavior gets, you know, gets old real quick for anybody, but then it gets better. As long as every day you like wake up and you choose to fight, you know, and it's like literally it's, there's not an equation to it. There's nothing. Shit's hard. Yeah. Life's hard. <laughs> yeah. Just in general. Yeah. It's, that's what it is. And that's where I think, you know, what I've got out of being a hotshot has helped me with just sobriety. I'm like, Oh man, you know, 
cold trailing in Alaska sucks. Let's do it for two weeks. <laughs> you know, my friend T, she goes, you know, hot shots. The only job where your pee is thick and your poop isn't, you know, like, you know, put your pack on, get your boots wet. They won't dry for three days, you know, and it's like <laughs> hot shots. <laughs> it's, 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 you just, yeah. And I don't know. Again. Everything's better now though. Again, and it's man. continuing to get better because you've learned how to embrace the suck. And then some days I get home from work and I open up bills and like the other week I sit there and like got missed. Like how stressed that shit was like $4,000 going up this month because of my dumbass decisions. Holy shit. Moved into a new place. Rent's gone up $800 a month for me. Like, damn, I'm not asking for a pity party. Let's work hard. Shit. You know, because the reality of it is if you learn the true like work ethic and values that are in the fire service, you go to civilian sector and do a job, you're going to blow their socks off every time. No, 100%. People don't understand how savage people in the fire service are. Oh, absolutely, you know? man. 100%, dude. And that's that's actually what we talked about in the last episode with uh, Monica there is... Uh, yeah, man, life out there is a life outside of federal service, but also, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity within it as well. I mean, just pick your pick what you want to do, man. The world is your oyster, but you got this like this work ethic and this 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 fucking hot shot attitude that you can offer the world. Like yeah, the world is your oyster at that point. It's it's the uh, the simulation, you know, the side missions in the simulation. <laughs> It's a side quest. We're just you gaining choose XP. your side quest. You know, what do you do in the horse side quest today? You know, a couple of years back, I did a milling side quest, learned how to mill black walnut down in Oregon. Did the oh, yeah. climbing side quest, the hot shot helitech engine side quest. What are we doing to horses? All right. I'm just you avoiding know. the main storyline altogether. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm just, fuck it. I don't need that junk. It's just choose your own not adventure. Trying to live a life full of like uh, crazy things. I just want to be happy, you know, just like the rest of us. Except I try to choose every day to not base my happiness off of other people's projections. On that, me, I, guess. I think that's another thing too, is I think we fall into the trap of trying to make everybody else around us happy when we don't truly make ourselves like take care of ourselves. That's a trap, man. I'm the opposite. I'm at work over here. I'm like, <laughs> Why can't you move faster? I'm like, oh shit, you can't do that to everybody. Like, God, like oh yeah. Oh you're yeah. Not being efficient. Put your damn phone down. If you're gonna take don't, you know, like don't do multiple trips between stations. Just take all the shit you need. Take it over there. Go, go, Just go. carry it all at once. <laughs> yeah, you're like, ah. Oh. And then you're like, oh yeah. They've not they've never even worked in fire. You're just I need to shut up. <laughs> I feel you, man. I think the hardest thing that I have dealing with, uh, like work outside of fire is everything is involved with a story. Like whether it's like, Oh, I have to do this or this is your assignment or this is my day. It always comes attached to like some bullshit story. And it's like, I don't want to mm-hmm. hear it. <laughs> Just go do your mm-hmm. fucking job. <laughs> it's yeah. one thing I'm str- struggling to figure out, I guess with my, uh, my new job, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, let's see. I get. I went the opposite way. I work around horses more than people. See, they don't. They don't talk very much. You know? Right. They don't argue. At least they might get a pissed, the way but... they do. But you know, it's it's funnier. Fair enough. It's a four year old thousand pound animal. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> right. So, here's a question for you, man. Uh, back to the culture element of wild on fire, right? And just built any fire, really fire in general, wildland structure, municipal, whatever you want to call it, fire, military, EMS, dispatchers, every first responder out there, they all have these like addiction chasing personalities that are either on the AT ADHD spectrum that are chasing the adrenaline right. rush. And they're very, very prone to impulsivity and, uh, <clears throat> self-medication and addiction. Right. I mean, if you're not chasing that addictive high that is adrenaline, 
you're chasing it with something else, right? It's been oh, said yeah. over and over and over again by multiple therapists on my show, multiple guests, even yourself. And that's one thing that I've always curious about is like, what, what is, what is your opinion of the culture kind of becoming enabling to alcoholism or for instance, how many, how many hotshot soups or squatties or firefighters are like, well, how many divorces you got under your belt or how many DUIs you got? You know, it's, it's like a joke, but it's true. Um, I would say it definitely varies where you work. Um, with my personal experience coming off of Bitterroot, you know, my superintendent was like, look, I'm really happy you didn't kill somebody. You know, I'll, I'll let you come work the season, but you need to toe the line. And my soup was like, no drinking. You know, uh, it's the drinking. <clears throat> this is what I think Excuse about me. it. You know, Sorry, man. Sure. It's popularized in, in fire culture for sure. You get back from a roll. How do you decompress rapidly? Yeah, you go party. And most people, yeah, you go party. And I know people who can manage that, who don't have any problems financially in their home life. Um, they don't have a physical dependency issues. And if that's their MO to go get hammered when they get home from an R and R for a night and recover the next, I mean, so be it to me. I can't. You know, um, but honestly, my crew has been super positive about and proactive in my helping my sobriety and checking in on me. And like, I think most crews that I've been on, except for a handful of people that I've known who stand out, you know, my dad was always told me it's like you got 96 percent of the fire service who are good guys and gals who go to work and they do their jobs and they do them well and they go home and then you have the four percent that are the loudest and those are the guys that everybody's seen at the bars everybody's seen party you know build that reputation everybody in fire has known that one person oh yeah you know i was that person <laughs> and uh It's, it can be hard to recognize the difference when you're just rolling and going out. I think it's important to check in on your friends in off seasons. Um, just it's hard and you feel alone. A lot of times when you feel alone, it's just better to drink. <laughs> and you're, at least in your head, you know, not your, in whoever said, but I don't know. I think it's changed. So I, think the agencies are starting to push on for, you know, I don't know. The agencies aren't doing stuff well, in my opinion, but with like stuff through Hotshot Brewery, through Anchor Point Podcast, through quite a few others, you know, Life with Fire, all of those pushing statistics and having professionals speak about how messed up the statistics for alcoholism and alcohol related deaths, suicides, you know, in our people who do our line of work is kind of sad. Sorry. Run on sentence. <laughs> no, no, you're good, man. No, it just, it just seems like that drinking and doing risky shit is kind of normalized across yeah. our culture. I guess that's what I'm getting at. I don't know yeah, if that's sure. I, I guess what I was getting to is that if you feel similar to that, that sentiment. Oh yeah. It's the fun thing to do. It's just what you do. It's what we all did every R and R, you know? And then, uh, I think it takes somebody like me to mess up pretty publicly, <laughs> you know, it's pretty hard to hide a DUI from, hot shot crew buddies yeah so they saw how bad my stuff was getting and a lot of them feel like eased off the drinking you know and, and we all kind of recognize that we were enabling ourselves 
you know, travel days, pushing the limits of how many beers we could drink, you know, and it gets worse and worse every time. So yeah, we're a rowdy bunch, man. You know, dollar IPAs at a bar in Butte will get you every time. Oh yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I, mean, I get it, dude. I, I mean, I've, I've done, some, yeah, I've drank a lot in my fire career. That's was part of the culture though. But it seems like every crew that I've been on, it was like already established. That's like, Hey, we work hard and we play hard. You know, that's, that's just what it is out here. And the places that I have worked, I don't know. Oh, if, yeah. I don't know if that's just like me falling into it as an impressionable young man, or if that's just kind of, I guess, uh, uh, inherent to the culture, uh, or if it was just like the places that I, I was working at. I think it is inherent at. to the culture. I mean, everybody I know likes to, to rage. Yeah. It's just, I think it's because the transitions are hard. It's hard to find something to fill that void. It's an unhealthy coping mechanism. It's readily available at all times. Across all 50 states, man. Yeah. yeah, it's advertised literally everywhere you go. Every day, at every place you see, society is telling you to, to, to drink it, you know? So it's pretty easy to fall into. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that and other things, too. I mean... I know there's been a, an occasion uh, I've, I've been told some stories and, you know, people have reached out to me as like problems with even prescription medication as well. I mean, it's not just doesn't stop at alcohol. Oh yeah. In my past, I've, uh, I've known of individuals who that, that have had severe issues with them who are now actually sober and still, you know, lucky that that was never something that lucky for them affected their career before they got it under control. But yeah, I just, I mean, I, it's, this is why I was saying at the beginning, like imposter syndrome, because I don't know that much. It's like, for me, that's all I can speak for. And, uh, but yeah, the culture makes, makes it easy and Everything that, you know, I don't I'm sure there's a bunch of other people in this job that are the same way, but it's like, I can never drink one beer. I drink 10, you know, my friends who have dabbled in other stupid stuff in their off season, it's just party, hardy, rage, 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 you know, rage, kayak, 40 foot waterfalls, rage, go free solo this climb, rage, go like ski mountain near some crazy thing and fly off the summit. You know, like what? Like it's there's no break because we never allow ourselves to break. And it's a hard routine to break out of. Oh yeah. I guess I guess it's maybe it's just the addictive personality that first responders typically have. Military, mm -hmm. you know, I mean it's you're chasing that high. If it's not adrenaline, it's something else. Whether it's yeah. sex, money, gambling, alcohol, drugs. I, whatever, man. I mean, it's, it just, like you said yourself, man, you did, I mean, the hotshot or the first responder is kind of one of those people that's wired differently to anything that they're going to put their mind to and do, they're going to do to the utmost extreme. Like, oh, yeah. even, I, I know, I know dudes that all they did, uh, there's a, there's a dude named Jackson out of, uh, the muck out of Winnemucca here. And that dude, mm -hmm. he's a good dude. But you know what he does? He chases his adrenaline rush in stadiums, professionally fighting over in Thailand, doing Muay Thai fights. <laughs> Wild man. This dude's a stud, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even my, uh, my dad's best friend, he's a, he was a smoke jumper and he used to do the same shit, man. He used to just go work out of Alaska, go jump, and then go to Thailand and fight Muay Thai. Go to a training camp like Sitman Chai or something like that. And it's, yep. it's even the fitness junkies, man. And they're junkies at the end of the day as well. Mm -hmm. You got these people that get into CrossFit, they get out of like the fire season, they get start coaching CrossFit. And next thing they know, they're like, I'm going to go to the games. <laughs> so my, my chasing highs, man. Who's one of the uh, sixes on Bitterroot. She's running a 31 mile race like six days before 80 hour criticals. 
Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at you like perplexed right now. I know the I, people exactly. that are listening to this. I'm like, what? And that's like a, a couple of them, the gals from the crew are going to do this. And I'm just like, holy shit, you guys are nuts. You're going to do pretty much an ultra right before criticals. Yeah. Yeah. No sweat. Right. <laughs> it's the extremes, man. Yeah. But I mean, she, I admire, you know, how she gets up and runs. And she's like, ah. Oh. This morning, my dog wouldn't even go running. It was negative 14. I felt like my throat was bleeding. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are you doing? The dog doesn't want to go with you. That's probably telling you a bigger message. Yeah. It's like, she's just like, oh, nope. Need to PT. I'm like, you're insane. I, hell yeah. I get it. But that's like the, the harder people push, the more we reward, you know? Oh yeah. It's like, oh, I suffered so much. And we're like, great job. You're like, yay, congratulations, <laughs> you didn't die. Let me validate Go do your more. existence. Right. <laughs> it's just yeah. it's just wild though, because you know, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, uh, in some shape, way, or form, we're all pretty much addicts in some yeah. regard. Like whether it's I don't know, it could be anything really. And I think that your story tells a bigger thing because you realize that you're able to pump the brakes and kind of step back and look at shit from a 30,000 foot view, right? You can turn that oh, volume yeah. down from 11 to yeah, a nice mellow three, just background Check. music, you know, got to get rid of the switch, turn it into a dial. Yeah. I just find something you yeah. love and do it. Like for me, it's been skateboarding lately. Like I've just been doing that every single day that I can to enter a flow state in my head. And like in my, you know, everything between horses and skateboarding, some people it's jujitsu, some people it's playing music, some people it's reading a book, yoga, but finding that flow state and um, immersing yourself in the present moment is really hard for people who work fire. It is. And I think that finding, you know, healthy outlets for that, like mine, my, I guess my two flow states, which are kind of newfound ones. I mean, it used to be snowboarding, uh, until I was horribly injured <laughs> multiple times uh, <laughs> done with that. I've got kids. I got a house payment. I don't want to deal with that shit anymore. Um, cause like I, like you said, man, we're all into the extreme. So yeah, I would try and do shit that was probably out over my level, but I would try and push myself. So I got injured a lot. Anyways, <laughs> I think my new flow state that I've found recently because I've worked a really stressful job, man. And then I'm managing, you know, two uh, board positions on two different nonprofits, my own business, my work, my day job. And then I've got, you know, an 11 month old who's teething. So he's not happiest little boy every once in a while every, <laughs> right now in this particular mm -hmm. juncture in time. So life is stressful, man. And that's the thing is like, I try and make it a point to get into my flow state by fly fishing and woodworking. Those, those are my two go-to things to where I can turn that dial oh, yeah. down, turn it off from a switch to a dial, man. That's, that's oh, yeah. huge. But being present in the moment, fly fishing is my jam. I know a lot of skateboarders who fly fish when they're injured. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that's like a thing for sure. And Definitely got to get you up in the bitter roots to go fly fishing. Yeah, dude. I actually uh, went up to, well, it wasn't in the bitter roots, but it was over in, uh, what is that? Uh, Bozeman over there in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. I, went and saw the, I went and saw everybody at the ranch, the mystery ranch. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I'm sick. I'm getting over the ass end of a cold here. And uh, anyways, I had the opportunity to go fish the Gallatin river in the West Yellowstone. And, uh, I just fair weather fisherman did, man. It was like snowing and kind of shitty. I was like, God damn it. Talk about hey. it. So I was like, no, why did I pass that up? <laughs> oh man. Ugh. Yeah. It's, it's been, I like fly fishing up here. It's these guys on this weird, God. I forget what fire we were on, but there's this little Creek that ran through this area that we had just got finished burning. We we're staged at an area and the guys um, took apart like the guts of P cord, you know, and like created enough line to catch these little Brooks trout that were in this little Creek. And they were kept, like, I was running around catching grasshoppers. You know, I'm not 
I wouldn't call myself a good angler by any means, but the guys on the crew, real good. And I would catch some grasshoppers and they would sit there and just keep hooking these little brook trout for like two, three hours while we were waiting to get our next mission on that fire. But it was, that was a really good time. It just made me think of it. <laughs> it's funny. The fun in the soccer, right? And you're out there staging. I mean, yeah, uh, you got to make, make do with day. what you got. Right. Oh yeah. But yeah, man, finding that flow state and like, I guess getting all that negativity out in some productive fashion, yours happens to be skateboarding. And I, I yeah, it's, yeah, you're pretty talented by the way. <laughs> I've seen some of your uh, photos on oh, Instagram. Not, not gnarly shit. I'm, I'm learning, relearning. We're all learning at something. So yeah. But yeah, man, I mean, translating that negative energy into something positive and just getting like the shit off your chest. I think that's huge, man. And that's very important to your healing. Can't be created or destroyed. It can only be moved. Right. Right. And transferred. So it's, you have to keep that going. Otherwise you'll rot. Oh yeah. Absolutely, man. That and the universe will never throw anything at you that you can't handle. That's for sure. Seriously. The amount of doors that opened up after I quit drinking are still astound me. Or just the stuff that it, like, wow, that was really easy. Normally that would have been really difficult, but I guess now it's, it just seems like the universe kind of opens up things for you. I'm not all woo woo or nothing, but it works out. Quit being an asshole and a drunk and you get more opportunities. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, man. It's like the energy. I'm a firm believer in there's no such thing as coincidence. And also I'm a firm believer in that, uh, the energy that you put out into the world, you'll receive back tenfold. Oh yeah. hundred percent. But yeah, man. Yeah. Um, as far as like any recommendations to the folks out there that might be experiencing something that you have experienced, what advice would you give them? Um, don't feel ashamed. Shame is the number one reason we stay in toxic cycles. You're human. Nobody's perfect. Um, honestly, the people who come forward and say that they have a problem are some of the most courageous people, in my opinion. It takes a lot to come to, you know, your fire family or your friends and be like, yeah, I fucked up. <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah, we know, but we're just going to move on. Right. You know, and it's, it's not as scary as you think. And, uh, you know, say if you ever do decide to get sober, it's, uh, just hard in the beginning, you'll lose 80% of your friends because you're not going to be doing the same shit as them. But just remember this part is the most important part is that once you get that out of the way, it leaves a ton of room for new, better things. And don't be scared to put yourself in vulnerable positions, you know, where you're giving your sense of, you know, I like to tell people like, Oh, I'm allergic to alcohol. I break out in handcuffs, you know, like <laughs> that's it's, a good one. I like it. It's like, it's, it, you know, the more, more people have my back than I have ever thought. It's seriously insane, but it's just because I've, Found, I put myself out there a little bit to find help and don't be scared to do that. It gets better. It's hard at first. You probably can't do it alone. And don't be scared of therapy and find that person on your crew that is your fucking ride and die, you know, ride or die person. And hold on to that person, you know, and they'll, you know, be there for them and they'll be there for you. And it's, it's, yeah, it gets easier. It's just more repetition and practice. 
And also, you know, not drinking in a, you know, I like kind of the punk rock, like hip hop attitude of rebelling, you know, graffiti art type of shit and just not drinking in a culture of people that that's all that goes on. You will stand out for the better. And, um, your friends will probably pick up on some of your better habits because it's what happened to mine. But it's kind of badass. For the first time in my entire adult life, I wake up now in the morning and if I don't feel good, I'm like, oh man, I'm getting sick. Not just like, oh, I'm hungover. So it just, it gets easier. And don't be scared to have a friend and don't be scared to hit up, you know, like you, friend, point, or the guys at Hot Shot Brewery or, you know, hit up the foundation because I did it and it works. And, uh, yeah, don't be ashamed. Nothing to be ashamed of. Be yourself. Repentlessly be yourself. Yeah. You mentioned something in the earlier, uh, you mentioned something earlier in this podcast and it said it, it sounds like a, a very, uh, tall order to admit that you have a problem or to reach out for help. And it seems like a scary position to put yourself in and it seems vulnerable and there's nothing more terrifying than being vulnerable. However, there is, in my opinion, I, I think there's no more strength and courage in a human than to reach out when they need help and they truly do, man. So to reach out for help, that's truly a courageous act. And I applaud you for reaching out in one of your darkest moments and getting better from it. Man, I wouldn't have reached out if it wasn't for the, uh, the people in my life to help me, to push me to reach out, you know? Uh, guys that have hot shot brewery can be pretty persuasive in uh, getting contact information <laughs> so they can connect you to the foundation. He might be an asshole, but he, he's, yeah, yeah. About he's 51% good, 49% evil. <laughs> he's an anti-hero. He's the Deadpool of coffee. You know, uh, that's a good way to put it. He is, he is the anti-hero. Yeah, yeah he is. But then that's the other thing made for not people who are struggling with it, but for people who know people and like, you're obviously seeing it. Don't be an asshole and just sit there and watch your friends self-destruct, do something that takes bravery and courage too. Oh, hell yeah, it does. Absolutely. So don't, I mean, don't be an enabler. Just, if you see something, say something, right? Yeah. Hey. Absolutely, man. I mean, that's, Hey, <laughs> do what's right. Let's tie it all back into the forest service. Hey, yeah. <laughs> bullshit here. Do what's right. Yeah, you know. Oh man. You take your L 180. Is that the class? Right? I think so. It's L 180 or 133. <laughs> I <can't> remember. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I blacked out. <laughs> I've been away from the agency now for less than a quarter of a year and I already forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no. Moving on to new horizons, really- man applaud people who will uh, hopefully can hear this and hopefully it helps. I don't know. Oh yeah, man. You got some powerful words, dude, and uh, a powerful story. And I hope that it rings true with those people that are thinking about it or may have questioned some of their life choices or uh, maybe need the courage or the inspiration to get some help. So Jesse, once again, dude, thank you so much for being on the show. But before we go, I always like to give you an opportunity to give a shout out to some homies, heroes, mentors. Who do you got for us, man? Mm, first and foremost is homie, my best homie, Alex Fallon. Um, she's just the uh, absolute best friend I've ever had. And got that good family sibling bond. I won't ever be broke or stuck. Uh, Ira Graves, who's out on the Klamath, 
he was really influential in helping me just be myself at work rather than trying to be what my ideal image of a forestry technician is. It's okay to be silly. Um, <coughs> my dad and mom definitely for putting up with all my shit throughout the years and uh, definitely sticking to their morals and being super steadfast in what they believe and in their support for me and uh, all the folks at Bitterroot it's been a wonderful three years um, definitely going to miss that crew and the time there was super awesome and a bunch of other people there's too many to mention but anybody and everybody I ever worked with I Except for a few of them, I never really had a bad time. Hell yeah. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story, man. I definitely appreciate it. And I hope this helps even one person. If it even helps one person, man, that's that's a win. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Oh, yeah. Well, Jesse, thank you so much, man. We'll catch you on the next one. Right on. Later, bro. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with my good friend, Jesse Morlock. Jesse, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us your experience, man. Uh, I know that we are a work hard, play hard, and uh, party hard kind of culture, but there is a point where that stuff goes too far. Yeah, you got to take care of yourselves. And luckily, uh, someone called you out on what was going on and you took the steps necessary to get some help and seek recovery. I am so stoked to have you on the show and tell your story, man, because I, something little tell, some kind of tells me a lot of people need to hear this, but it's good. You know, the more uh, self-awareness and awareness that we bring to the uglier truths about our culture, I think the better. Yeah, we can only go up from here. But anyways, Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It was awesome. We'll get you uh, going on the next one as well. If you want to go uh, follow Jesse on his Instagram, just go and look up at Mr. Mountain Lion and you'll find Mr. Jesse Warlock. Feel free to ask him some questions. Oh, hell, if you need a buddy to talk to, if you're experiencing some uh, similar stuff, by all means, reach out to him. But with that being said, I want to thank everybody for listening and hope everybody's doing well. Keep sharing the message and uh, yeah, buddy check. Keep looking out for your homies. So, we got a special shout out to our sponsors. We've got Mystery Ranch, built for the mission, purveyors of the finest damn packs in the Wildland Fire game. Go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out the Backbone series. We've got Hot Shot Brewery, kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. And if you want to get your hands on some of this kick-ass coffee or some of this sweet Wildland Firefighter-themed apparel, well, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com. We've got The Ass Movement, funny name, serious about stewardship on the land and doing your business right in the woods anyways it's the finest in pooh bearing propaganda go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement and last but not least we've got the smoky generation aka the american wildfire experience bethany you have an awesome organization if you want to find out more about that go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check it out as for the rest of you thank you for listening in y'all know the drill Stay safe, stay savage, peace.